the, one of the difficulties uh, that we have in modern age is sometimes we understand the, the images that Jesus has used because we see them all the time. Like maybe the, good, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, all of us know, even though it's an antique language, we know the, the point. And in, in what, when um, Jeremiah is using the image of shepherds who should have taken care of scattered the flock, none of us here, I think, is a, is a shepherd or has much experience to it. But, you know, it's funny, I, I did this a couple, three weeks ago about farming. And there was a farmer here, so I, I said, well, I better check out so see what they're doing. So I don't think it's so very important to understand the nature of, of shepherd and sheep, although that might be interesting. But more interesting is the point, the tragic point, that both Jeremiah and Jesus are making. Jeremiah, his whole life, as I said in the intro to the first reading, had, had lived and tro proclaimed God's word, trying to call the people to a deeper fidelity. A deeper fidelity to God, to turn away from fruitless alliances, even political alliances. Uh, in that, if you read the book of Jeremiah, you know he came close several times to being really assassinated because they just couldn't stand his message. But uh, he survived, but he survived to see all the destruction of, of Jerusalem. It's the city level to the ground to see the people scattered, taken into exile in 587 BC, taken into exile into Babylon. He did not go. He went down as an old man into Egypt. But it could not have been for him any kind of satisfaction to see uh, the, the people just absolutely laid low. Scattered. So he has this vision, as you heard, he says, you know, you, the, all of the kings and the, the rulers who were supposed to care for the people have proved unworthy. In fact, they've been the opposite, they've scattered the people. Uh, and then he says, there's going, but he still has hope. You know, God is going to raise up a, a, a shepherd, uh, a, a different kind of person, uh, you know, from, a, from the stump of Jesse, Jesse being the grandfather father of David and the grandfather of Solomon. And he says that, and this is going to be the Lord our justice. Finally there's going to be someone who, who will establish justice. And certainly the early Christians saw in Jesus that figure. They saw someone who was gathering people together. Someone who was healing them. Someone who was feeding it. Right after this passage that I just read today, if you continue on, in chapter 6 of Mark, you see that Jesus didn't only teach the people this vast crowd, but that he then he then multiplied the loaves, fishes, so that they might physically eat. So was, and we see the image of a real shepherd, right? I mean, even if we don't know that much in a personal way about you, we see that Jesus intended the context. You remember last week's gospel, Jesus sent out the uh, his disciples, he sent them two by two, and he sent them to proclaim the reign of God, the presence of the power and the salvation of God, and to heal the sick and to cast out demons. And so they return, and then the story picks up today, and Jesus, they want to tell Jesus what's happening, what, how God is using them, how God is, is working through them. And obviously there were so many crowds around he wants to get them aside. He wants to hear. He wants to hear the, the story of salvation. And he wants perhaps to let them unpack, so to speak, and understand what God can do in their lives. Unfortunately, the people could walk faster than the boat could go. Right? Um, so when they get there, the crowd, bigger crowd maybe, even then, waiting for. And it says that, uh, the, the, the reading says that when he looked and saw the crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them. In English, it's kind of a milk toast image. But in Greek, it's, it, it's that kind of feeling 
you get when you read, for example, about the massacre in Colorado, if your stomach turns over, you want to sit to your stomach. It's almost a physical reaction at that time. You hear a disaster, and you're like, or you hear the, the tragedy of something, you're like, oh, how could this be? You know, it's a kind of that kind of move. So it's, a, you know, and that, it's that kind of reaction that Jesus has. He's like, oh, gosh, look at me. You know, like scattered and broken and unloved. And so immediately he <laughs> begins to teach. He begins to tell them the meaning of their life. He begins to show them the way to wholeness. He begins to act out the healing. He had other intentions. He wanted to get them. his disciples, but he couldn't resist the need that he saw before him. Now there are two things I think that we can draw from that. And the first thing is that there may be you and I here that are, are, are lost. Well, there is one person who won't be texting when you need it. That's God. <laughs> there is one person who can answer your deepness, who can put it again right. So if there's maybe somebody here, maybe many people here have, have lost loved ones, uh, lost a job, could be many things. They've been betrayed. They, they betrayed themselves. They're disappointed and ashamed. You come to the right place when you come to Jesus. And He always has time for you. You know, this is the, the first thing we have to know is that He is forever our shepherd. You know, that God always is ready to respond. Always ready to reach out. Always ready to heal and to show you the way of life. And so, if you find yourself now or at another time lost, bewildered, abandoned, depressed, whatever it might be, in Christ, in God, is the, the wholeness that you see. You know? Just like the disciples. He's ready to respond, even though he had other intentions like God. Riding in that boat, ready to, to minister to you and me. So if you're broken, come to the Lord. But secondly, once you have the gift, once that wholeness, once you experience the Lord, He wants to send you out. You know? It's not enough that, that we get our act together by the grace of God. We are meant to give us a gift. The, you know what scripture says, the gift you have received, give as a gift. You know? And you say, well, I, how am I to, I'm like these disciples sent out two by two, what do I have? Maybe you don't, maybe I don't, but it's God who's going to work for us. You know? Our part is to be willing to be that kind of shepherd, that kind of minister within our family, within our office, within our association. We have to be ready to willing and let God's grace work through us to bring other people to say the message. You know, it's not enough to get our act together. The second movement is that He wants us. He has a plan to make us disciples, following Him just like He did last week and sending us out with that message. So, step first to, to wholeness in Christ. Um, and then, let the Holy Spirit lead you within the context of your own life to be a living testament of what God can do. Of how God can heal, how God can forgive, how God can reconcile, and how God can save. That by the reality, the gift you have received, give us gift. So I pray that you might have an opportunity this afternoon, or this after tomorrow, or to, to, to let the grace that you have received be given as a gift. Because there is a fast. You know the majority of Americans don't go to church. The majority of Catholics don't go to church. You know? And maybe you don't have to go to church. We, we're going to send you and me as missionaries. You know? And we'll bring the church to them. We'll bring Jesus to them by the way we live.
by the way we minister with the grace of the Holy Spirit. So, first receive and then give. If you've got wholeness now, you've got a mission. You've got a mission.